Irene of Athens, Irene of Byzantium, welcome to a podcast about the woman who made herself emperor and whom some honor as a saint. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm Lucy, and on this episode, I'll be discussing Irene of Athens, who rose from obscurity and established herself as sole ruler of the Byzantine Empire in the 8th century. The Empress Irene has sometimes been venerated as a saint in the Greek Orthodox Church. One of her contemporaries described her as the holy good sovereign, but her rule met with rebellion, and modern historians have often written about her with horrified fascination. On this episode, we'll be exploring both Irene's remarkable life and her reputations, which have been wildly varying from her own day to the present. This episode topic is one requested by a listener, so I should open with both thanks to that listener and something of a preemptive apology, because a tell-all biographical scoop is just impossible to write. Despite her historical prominence and incontrovertible historical significance, there's a great deal about Irene that we just don't know. Her early life, for instance, could be great material for the first episode of the miniseries Her Life Deserves, but it can't be covered by a history podcast. We learn of her first when she is chosen at a bride show, more on that in a minute, as the future spouse of Emperor Leo IV. And as is the case with many figures of history, we know much more of Irene's reputation than reality. Byzantine chroniclers wrote down what they thought was important about Irene, and why they thought it was important. And most of this was connected to her political career and her influence on the restoration of icons. Even big things that we might like to know, from what family did she come? How did she end up as a potential bride for the emperor? What factors influenced her marriage into the imperial dynasty? Are much more obscure. To begin with, the bride show was less sensational than it sounds. It was a not uncommon occurrence, and the narrative about this as presenting the most beautiful young woman as a suitable bride for the future emperor, think Cinderella or Scheherazade, almost certainly conceals a more complex bureaucratic process. But in this process, the mothers, and on the imperial side, sometimes grandmothers, of the candidates were crucially involved. So Irene's participation in these processes and events shows us at least a glimpse of several possibilities for female influence. Herself chosen through this process, later, as Empress, Irene was invested in choosing a bride for her son who would fit with her own imperial projects, or at least pose no threat to them. Though she had initially entertained the possibility of a marriage between her son Constantine and one of Charlemagne's daughters, Irene ultimately chose a young Armenian woman, like Irene, of modest origins, and we might also say, like Irene, both intelligent and devout. The stakes of who got to rule Byzantium were particularly fraught because Irene and her husband Leo, rather unusually, had only one child, the son who would eventually reign as Constantine VI. Judith Heron has suggested that this may have been due to medical complications from Irene's pregnancy and childbirth. And given the high stakes of imperial succession at any time, but especially in early medieval Byzantium, this hypothesis would seem to bear weight. The theory that Leo refused to sleep with her for theological reasons is less than plausible, though contemporary Byzantine writers, eager to stress the importance and high personal stakes of the conflict over icons, favored it. This is a good example of how historians wrote with the goal of creating a clear historical narrative in ways distinctive to the Middle Ages. Byzantine historians deliberately crafted their narratives to be entertaining as well as commemorative. They might even be orally performed, which would have made juicy anecdotes, like the one in which Leo found two icons under Irene's pillow, especially appealing. We have unusually few historical texts, that is to say, texts written as histories, from the 7th through 9th centuries. And from the 8th century in Byzantium, which included the turbulent period of Irene's rule, we have none at all. So we rely on a wide range of other textual and material sources, and later histories like that of George Cadrenos, who wrote about the icons under the pillow, and that of Theophanes. The latter's history suggests that Leo's approach to icons was more pragmatic than fanatical, as he began his reign as a friend to the mother of God and the monks, in the phrase of the pro-icon chronicler. 
Theophanes attests to the fact that Irene was an effective strategist, establishing herself quickly as co-ruler in the wake of her husband's death and eliminating potential threats to her own authority and her son's. For Theophanes, the main event of Irene's reign was the restoration of icons, but he also recounts her use of naval strategies, her punishment of conspirators, and her negotiation of peace with the Abbasid Caliphate. In other words, he presents her as a highly effective ruler. Irene's political career was polarizing during her lifetime, and her historical reputation, too, has been much debated. It should come as no surprise, perhaps, that scholarly assessments of her activities have often been affected by modern perceptions of what women should do, or of what medieval women were normally able to do, or both. And then, of course, there is misogyny. It's true that the fragmentary and partisan accounts we have of Irene's political agency make it challenging to assess her holistically, but to ask, as one historian did, whether or not she had ideas of her own seems to me to betray more of modern biases than medieval realities concerning women in politics. Another historian, for instance, asserts that she was always convinced that she was in the right. While there are some historical figures about whom I think this inference could fairly safely be drawn, Irene is not one of them. The same scholar describes her as proud and passionate, violent, brutal, and cruel, tenacious and obstinate, subtle and dissembling, with an incomparable genius for plotting and intrigue. This description draws on stereotypes not only of women in power, but of medieval Byzantium itself. The English language uses Byzantine as an adjective to describe things which are complex to the point of tortuousness, elaborate, and obscure. This says a lot about perceptions of the Byzantine Empire, but not a lot about its historical realities. As Leonora Neville has observed, Byzantine history is the history of the Roman Empire in the Middle Ages. The ideas of a stark break between antiquity and the Middle Ages and a similarly dramatic cultural break between East and West have now been discarded and discredited by historians. But they shaped the writing of medieval history, and especially Western European writing about Byzantine history, for a long time. If you're interested in Byzantine history more broadly, I recommend the podcast Byzantium and Friends, which is linked in the episode bibliography. It was far from unusual for Byzantium's royal women to shape and direct imperial power, although it was unusual for women to reign alone, as Irene did, taking the title not of empress, but emperor. Despite being an outsider who married into the imperial family, Irene was the first woman to rule Byzantium entirely in her own right, and her career and character have come under often misogynistic scrutiny. One historian, while conceding that primary sources describe her as having greatness of soul and a masculine spirit, definitely intended as a compliment in the context of medieval politics, gave it as his opinion that she was neither truly energetic nor really brave. Paul Adam, meanwhile, a late 19th century French novelist, wrote about her desire to revive the venerations of icons using the language of sexual desire, in ways explicit enough that I am not going to quote them here. John Julius Norwich was one of the great historians of Byzantium and a great prose stylist to boot, but he had a very low opinion of Irene, characterizing her as scheming and duplicitous, consumed by a devouring ambition and an insatiable lust for power. Is it possible that she was all of those things? Sure, but we don't know. And whether she ends up cast as a devout woman yearning, possibly erotically, to fulfill the desires of her faith, or scheming and duplicitous, her extraordinary stature as a woman who wielded imperial power against the odds has tended to polarize opinion. That Irene was able to establish independent imperial power was due both to her effective cultivation of church support and her ability to navigate court politics. When Irene was widowed in 780, she appears to have taken on the mantle of imperial power without hesitation. Moreover, she embraced bold policy changes from the start, even while still ruling jointly with her son. She reversed almost half a century of the imperial stance against icons. Contemporaries found this surprising, but many exiled supporters of icons were delighted by this change. 
The controversy over icons could be an episode all its own, but in brief, this was not only an intense theological debate, it was, but also an intensely important political issue. For one thing, worshippers offering veneration to icons bowed before them as one would bow to the emperor. So icons could be seen as posing a potential rival focus to imperial authority. And that's just within Christianity. From the mid-7th century onwards, Byzantium's main political and territorial rivals were the increasingly powerful Islamic caliphates. And the practice of making images of holy people, of course, could be interpreted as a direct challenge to Islamic teachings on acceptable use of images. And Byzantium, often at a military disadvantage, had no wish to provoke through any such challenge. So Irene's policy was not only bold, but potentially risky. One historian of the mid-20th century explained Irene's policy as a result of her piety. Not only was piety characteristic of the age, he argued, but Irene's piety was intense, burning, aggravated by the events of the troubled times in which she lived. Women's naturally mystical piety, he concluded, contributed in no small way to Irene's sympathy with the cause of the iconophiles, or iconoduels, the pro-icon party. In contrast, Judith Heron has argued that Irene's partisanship in the controversy over icons was one more strategy that she used to consolidate her own imperial power. Still, as I mentioned earlier, it was a risky move. The army was primarily iconoclast and mutinied in response to Irene's declaration of support for the iconodule cause. It was not a very effective rebellion, and it was very effectively put down. Whatever Irene's calculations in supporting the cause of icons, it was not a policy chosen for its popularity. She then convened an ecumenical council to which the Pope and patriarchs were alike invited. It first convened in 786, but was dramatically disrupted. Shortly after all the delegates were seated, soldiers from the Imperial Guard and the garrison of Constantinople burst into the church and demanded that everyone leave. The delegates did, and the papal legates took ship for Rome, indicating that they, at least, perceived this as indicative of underlying unrest, not merely an isolated incident. It took just over a year for the council to reconvene. Eventually, icons were reinstated with a triumphant sermon on the theological justifications for their use. And this cause, championed by Irene, triumphed in the long term, leading to her commemoration as a crucial supporter of icons, of the saints, and of the faith that honored them both. The re-establishment of icons did not, however, serve to establish Irene's imperial power more securely. Indeed, less than two years later, her son Constantine hatched a plot against her and her government. When Irene discovered this, she punished most of the conspirators severely. The Emperor Constantine, however, she punished as if he were a child. He was thrashed, given a stern talking to by her personally, and kept in his room for several days. As a method of performing palace politics, and essentially saying that if he was going to behave like an immature child, she would treat him as one, it was extremely poetic, but it was ultimately less than effective. The army rebelled in favor of Constantine in 790, and Irene was forced temporarily to retire. How she managed to unretire is one of the many fascinating episodes about which we know sadly little. But she was restored to joint rulership by her son in 792, and remained joint ruler with him for five years. The short version of how this joint rulership came to an end is that Constantine, once again, made an impulsive decision. He made a second marriage, while his wife was still alive, to one of Irene's ladies-in-waiting, and so doing, he scandalized not only the Byzantine church, but society as a whole. His second wife bore him a son, complicating the succession. And then, on top of everything, he led an unsuccessful and anticlimactic military campaign. On his return from this campaign, a court faction tried to arrest him, he tried to flee to the army, and Irene took possession of the great palace, effectively deposing him. And when this was done, and Constantine was at last arrested, he was blinded. This was done, according to Theophanes, in a cruel and grievous manner, with a view to making him die, at the behest 
of his mother and her advisors. The blinding of Constantine VI has often been referred to in the historiography as the prime illustration of Irene's allegedly unusual ruthlessness. John Julius Norwich is not exceptional in referring to it as one of the foulest murders that even Byzantine history has to record, even though it was not a murder. The thread of sexism here is unmistakable. The implicit question is always, how could a mother do that to her son? But violence within the ruling family was far from exceptional in Byzantium, or come to that in other early medieval kingdoms and empires. Moreover, I think it's notable that Irene's action can be read as a reaction to both her son's repeated attempts to bar her from imperial power and his own mismanagement of that power. So, while I'm not saying that we should read this act as morally neutral, of course, it is important to view it in its political and historical context as an action that is ruthless, violent, and comprehensible, rather than an illustration of a woman's vicious nature. Irene's own rule was ended by a ministerial conspiracy against her, and she was always acutely aware of the risks and the opportunities of such plots. Irene as Emperor of Byzantium was both an astute and effective politician. She corresponded with other imperial rulers, Charlemagne in Aachen, Harun al-Rashid in Baghdad, and also engaged in delicate diplomatic relations with the papacy. Pope Hadrian I wrote to her in approving terms about her defensive icons, and in disapproving ones about Byzantine sovereignty over disputed ecclesiastical territories in the Mediterranean. To these claims, Irene simply did not respond, avoiding direct conflict while also maintaining Byzantine sovereignty. One of history's more interesting what-ifs, to my mind, is the question of what might have come of the rumored marriage plans between Irene and a guy who wore long trousers like a barbarian, but whom we have come to know as Charlemagne, Emperor of the Franks. There is, of course, no guarantee that that imperial fusion would have lasted, but the fact that it was considered speaks to the strength of their imperial ambitions as each of them reshaped Roman models. A powerful and influential figure, Irene nevertheless remains an enigmatic one. But the events of her life show her, I think, to have been shrewd, intelligent, and bold, as well as, sometimes, ruthless. Having come from an unknown family in the then-provincial Greek peninsula to the palace of Constantinople, she laid claim very effectively to both the apparatus and the rhetoric of imperial power. Irene issued laws in her own name, and, as emperor of Byzantium, issued coins with her portrait and title on both sides, representing her with the emblems of her power, with crown, orb, and scepter. She ruled longer than her husband, Leo IV, and did so effectively, governing an expansive empire with international connections. Her achievements are, by any measure, remarkable, as she used the mechanisms of the political elite into which she married to craft her own imperial career. Interested in owning some Footnoting History merch? You can find out more through our shop link at www.footnotinghistory.com. Want to support the show and keep it open access? Our Patreon is at patreon.com forward slash footnoting underscore history. You can also follow us on Twitter at History Footnote or Facebook and Instagram as Footnoting History. And of course, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>